record on this computer. Preparing to live stream the webinar. So it's just going through that and I'll And we're on. Very good. And good morning to everyone and uh, good morning to Graham Hand, uh, my good friend from uh, the southwest of Victoria, um, who's in his um, beautiful bluestone mansion down there, as all people who in the southwest of Victoria seem to reside in, um, <laughs> that promised land of Australia, Felix. <laughs> so welcome, Graham. <laughs> oh, thanks for having me, Darren. It's good to see you. Good to see you too, mate. So I've uh, got a bit to get to today. Um, I just wanted to, I'll just get up on the screen there. Uh, well, this piece that I had uh, prepared earlier um, where I was <clears throat> just looking at um, that within the Regrarians platform, um, some, a lot of the stuff that we'll talk about today, which uh, might seem a little bit interesting once we get dive into this conversation is within the lens of, uh, or within the layer of forestry. Um, because for forestry, for us, um, within the Regrarians platform, we're really talking about um, not just flora, but we're also talking about fauna. And so a lot of uh, what Graham will talk about today will be both, um, but particularly grassland for flora and grassland uh, fauna species. So uh, we might talk a little bit about some woody vegetation as well here and amongst it as well. Um, so top today's topics, um, we want to talk about utilisation. That's a really interesting discussion about um, because there's a lot of stuff out there about tall grazing and just how much one should utilise, uh, what, what you should be leaving, be leaving behind and so on. How to increase uh, biodiversity as an outcome of landscape function. Um, and what about the role of legumes? Uh, Graham's got some thoughts on that and uh, some practice notes, which should be interesting for people on legumes and their role in all of this uh, in pastoral systems and also the role of trees and other woody species in um, pastoral landscape management. And then also I wanted to talk to Graham about some of his work in financial planning, holistic management, financial planning and consulting and, uh, and go from there. So um, with that, I'm just going to get rid of that screen and I'll let you share the screen now if you want to just press your button there, Graham, that should do the job, mate. Okay. Hopefully. I'll make sure on another screen here. And of course, uh, if you're on Facebook, um, you can just type in questions and for Bob, um, you can type in some questions on Zoom if you wish as well. So go for it. All right, that looks, that's perfect, Graham. So just, uh, yep, perfect. So, so I can start that as a presentation? You can so. start that as a presentation now. Fantastic. Just go full screen and away you go, bro. Very good. So um, oh, welcome, everyone. Um, just going to sort of go through a few of those topics that uh, Darren talked about. So I find there's sort of a fair bit of confusion out there and it's quite tricky to make um, uh, plan grazing work. Um, and so I just want to go through a process of trying to do that. But I was just going to start with sort of what we've done. So the start of the agenda is really just that what's our story, you know, the common problems caused uh, by sort of utilisation and grazing height. Just a brief little mention about complexity, some of the research and then just some of that um, financials and Q&A from there. So... Um, I'll just start sort of, I, um, I, I started agriculture sort of in my late 20s, um, but I'd grown up with friends that had farms, so I was sort of always interested. And when I started farming myself um, in uh, the late 80s, I found that I was very incompetent um, and uh, that I, I, yeah, like I, I had one disaster after another. And then, uh, so I went searching and and came upon um, holistic management through a long process of trying to look at um, a solution to all the problems in agriculture. We had weeds, we had, you know, from thistles to cape weed to crickets to uh, red-legged earth mite to animal health problems to, to that whole thing of yeah, um, cutting hay, making silage, doing all that sort of thing. And, uh, 
and uh, I went and spoke to one of our um, department beef extension officers and he described all my problems and he said, oh, no, that sounds about right. And I thought, wow. So I just couldn't think that that could be right. So eventually came across Alan's, one of Alan's early books, which sort of was very tricky, but sort of started implementing it. And then um, sort of in 96, I uh, went and joined the educator training in um, New Mexico and trained with Alan. And uh, Alan spent the weekend with me, so I had a lot of time with him. And um, and then later on, I said, oh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of the grazing behaves differently in Mediterranean climates. And he said, well, why do you think I spent the weekend with you? So it was like sort of he'd already planned what he was doing. So he seemed to be using a different deck of cards than I was. Um, so, yeah, so I worked for uh, as an accredited educator, Savory Institute and Holistic Management International. Um, what uh, I can remember thinking that sort of we needed to increase farmer success, that sort of the only success that matters is farmer success. And so I've been searching for that since early on. When I trained in 96, uh, someone wrote up on a flip chart that, um, that there'd been a lot of people trained, that less than 5% of people trained were successful. And I thought at the time being type of person I am, I'll, I'll do better than that, but uh, I didn't. So I've been searching ever since, and I believe that two of the uh, the big uh, breakthroughs have been work with Doug Mackenzie Moore from Canada on barriers to adoption and, uh, and combining Alan's work with Dave Snowden's complexity work at Cognitive Edge, and I'll make sure I've got those in the notes as well, the references to those. And then in 2014, I just felt that sort of I did that smack myself on the forehead and just realised that um, the problem was that we were trying to give people general information, whereas the barriers to success are actually individual barriers to success. So the example I've been using is the financial one. I, I work with people that can, can write an Excel spreadsheet macro that will actually download their bank feed and put it into a report. And I've also got people that don't like using Excel spreadsheets. So, you know, so you've got to provide different systems for people. Whereas I've been trying to say here, this is the way you do it. Well, you've actually got to do that. Um, people that I work with, um, you know, some people like to use grazing charts. Some people like to put the numbers on a on a paddock plan. They don't want. They don't like the grazing chart. It's too busy or too confusing or whatever. So there's all different. Um, there's all different ways and you've got to adapt to that. And it was sort of like, oh, lucky it only took me 20 years to work that out. So, um, but yeah, so we've, since then we've been having a breakthrough and helping people implement. So, so some of, just quickly, just some of the problems on that grazing height and utilisation. Uh, what, what we see is people running out of grass sort of. So, uh, and it's quite confusing for people, this whole, how can, um, yeah, so let's say you have high utilisation and low utilisation. So if you only take the tops off the grass, how can you run out of grass? And was a, a common thing. And the, in the US, they, they see it as a summer slump where um, the grasses run out of energy, run out of root reserves. What happens really clearly uh, with low utilisation is that you start to lose the density and diversity of the better perennial grasses. So I'll come back to all of these. You also set up the conditions that you're actually increasing what I consider to be the two types of weeds. So you increase the annual weeds and you increase the woody uh, weeds and I'll, I'll cover that as well. And there can be issues with animal health. So. Um, so I'll come back to those, and uh, and can you make sure I do, Darren? If I don't, uh, if I don't remember. So, the uh, the research. No, no worries at all, mate. <laughs> the, 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 the research is uh, um, is pretty clear on this, but I just wanted before I got there, I just wanted to quickly talk about complexity. Um, when we're talking about something as complex as supplying animals to the land within a farm business. There's going to be more than one way of thinking about it. So this is a slide from um, uh, Cognitive Edge down the bottom there that uh, D 
Dave Snowden's, if the evidence supports conflicting hypotheses and contradiction cannot be resolved, then it's complex. What we do in the area we work in is complex is complex so we need to embrace that complexity rather than sort of just try and simplify it into um, uh, into simple uh, formulas or rules or whatever so I just, that, that's the only thing is there's more than one answer here in a complex system more than one answer works so you've got to work out well what's the answer that works for me and I'll try and keep that theme um, as I go through that there is more than one. How do you work out what's going to work for you? It's very unsatisfying. When I worked, at the, you know, worked out that this is sort of, um, yeah, like you've got to do the work yourself on your own land with your own animals, with your management skill, with your soil types, you know, with your climate. It really, yeah, like it didn't didn't help. But I, I hopefully I, I've worked that out a bit and can help people sort of sort that complexity out. So. Um, just uh, <coughs> excuse me. Just going back to the um, the research. So most of the research about leaving a lot of I, I think there's two schools of thought. There might be more, but basically uh, leave a lot of leaf area or take it all down. So high utilization and low utilization. So um, graze the top third or leave, eat half, leave half is the low camp. You'll hear them talk about that. And the other ones like um, Neil Dennis, Gabe Brown, um, uh, uh, Johann Zietzman, they talk about high utilisation. So the science that the, that the low uh, utilisation people use is this work done by uh, Frank Kreider, uh, in the USDA so, soil con and he called it root growth stoppage uh, and and root death is some of one of some of the words he uses and stuff like that so this is this is available I think on the internet um, but uh, yeah so this works done and what he did was he did all these trials of in um, in glass sided uh, um, containers where they trimmed the grass with scissors um, I have a little bit of a problem with that because you don't get the stimulation of the pulling um, or of the uh, the grass growth hormones, which is in the saliva of the ruminants. You're not getting any of that interaction there. And, um, and yeah, but it, it gives us a, an idea of what happens when you defoliate plants. So um, they did, he did a lot of work and it's really good work. And this is, this is sort of the, uh, the key, uh, the key photo for me. So this is this uh, uh, taking, you know, like different uh, plants in different pots and then taking them through and clipping them at different amounts of days. So, you know, from no clipping all the way through to um, taking 90% off. So taking different levels of uh, utilization and seeing what it did to the roots. Where they took none off on the, on the left-hand side there, they got really good uh, regrowth so uh, the white roots are the new growth so they stain them when uh, just before um, before clipping the roots had been blackened so right through to that they had no regrowth where they took it down to 90 percent so you're getting this root growth stoppage so people go oh well that's a bad thing and that's uh, and that's I believe what's driving a lot of the thinking um, so they're using this science to say Oh well, I should leave it. And look, you get still get some root regrowth if we uh, if we only take forty percent or fifty percent or whatever it is. So the work's been uh, done in that way. Um, so not in a paddock, not looking at uh, landscape function, not looking at seasonal uh, over time. So it's a very much a snapshot. So I'm going to argue an alternative view that um, we need to start thinking about this a bit deeper. That 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 slide there we, isn't enough information to manage complexity and, and take a holistic view of the whole farm. So, so the alternative view, what, what's in the alternative view? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I've been saying why we need root growth stoppage. So why would you need root growth stoppage? So it's really clear that the roots uh, are more likely to perform soil organic matter, uh, the SOM, then um, 
than the above ground plant parts. So anything, uh, the, uh, the roots and the liquid carbon pathway, um, all those are driven by sort of what's happening underground. So we need to be thinking about what do we do. So when you take the tops off, you tend to uh, slough off, slough off a bit of the roots and um, and and that so, uh, forms soil organic matter much better. And it and it actually stimulates the plant to start providing um, more carbon through the liquid carbon pathway. So we need to be thinking about pulsing the plant rather than always have it, if I can go back, rather than always have it growing roots like that far left there, we're talking about pulsing the plant rather than continual growth. So the roots in a perennial grass, the roots are still, um, yeah, the roots are still feeding and, and, uh, and looking after the soil biota. So it's really, uh, it's really sort of somehow we've got ourselves into some sort of weird uh, position so um, so that uh, the roots and the uh, liquid carbon pathway that Christine Jones I work with uh, Christine Jones and Colin Sice a lot which is uh, I think it's a privilege to have access to to those two because they're just great we have uh, when we go for dinner after a presentation and things we have fantastic uh, ranging discussions about these subjects so so why we need root growth soft stoppage it's about pulsing the roots the other one is that if you don't use the plants deep enough um, you start to lose the better perennials so here's an example in one of our practice areas where um, Trevor, Trevor the dog's sort of in the middle there and it, it's gone back to sort of a biannual or, or Yorkshire fog grass so starting to lose those better grasses so instead of those high successional highly palatable perennial grasses you start to get this slide unless you're going deeply into that and stimulating the soil germinating the viable soil seed bank providing the conditions and lots of germination sites that uh, that heavy use, you actually start to sort of start promoting these poorer grasses. So, um, so, the, so it's a double whammy to me. You're not, you're not making the soil as healthy as you could and you start to lose these grasses. So this is what we find in our environment and sort of the areas that I work in sort of, um, well, from sort of uh, central west New South Wales, sort of down to the bottom of Tasmania and southeast South Australia and all of Victoria. So we need to um, we need to start thinking about well, what do we do here? What's the other research? Um, the this, I use uh, Grass Productivity, Andre Voisin's book, which was one of those books that had a really big influence on on Alan Savory. But this is the part people quote about from him is just this whole idea that if you leave enough uh, leaf area, you won't, uh, you won't sort of slough off the roots, you won't stop the roots growing and you'll get faster recovery. So, so but if you look in there, he's actually saying the logical idea is therefore not to do this. So, but then the next slide I think is sort of what people have forgotten. So, um, yeah, a lot of people talk about the sigmoid curve and not taking it down into phase one and things like that. But you know, the next part is the crucial, you know, again, we see here perfectly sound, theoretical and scientific considerations running foul of practical obstacles. And uh, the reason I could always remember that was because I had to look up what a priori meant. So it was one of those ones where I go, oh, why'd that stick in my head? And I go, oh, now I remember because it's got a priori in it. So, so prior to um, doing the experiment, you couldn't work out that that isn't the way it works. And, and what actually happens is that the cows or the sheep or the goats, they graze the plants that they like first before they move on to the next plant. So they don't mow at certain heights. So the paddock will have the appearance that you've only taken, say, the top third off it. But within that, you will have plants that they've eaten right to the ground. And that's how we start to lose those better perennials, because usually it's the much more palatable um, uh, uh, higher successional perennials that they take right to the ground. They actually don't have a, a height setting on them. 
So anyone that tells you that your grazing's about height, yeah, you know, like uh, you know, put them in when it, uh, the classic Australian one is put them in when it's two beer cans high and take them out when it's one beer can high, they're missing this point that it's actually the animals don't graze like that. And I'll come back to some more of that from Ellen's book. The other person that sort of um, also gets a bit of a run in this area is Johann Zietzman. So in his book, Man, Cattle and Veld, he just says the information is useless, is as useless as, and then he, the recommendation that grass should not be defoliated close to the ground. The latter information may be of value one day when we have taught cattle to graze at an even height. So... <coughs> I really like uh, I really like those two um, because they one uh, Voisin's work is quoted as saying that we shouldn't graze it down when in actual fact he's saying that we should and uh, and then Johan's usual um, um, not taking any prisoners approach so, <laughs> yeah, like, so. <laughs> He's an, a, a, an African with a blunt yeah. tongue. Yeah. <laughs> I get into trouble for saying they make Australians look sophisticated. So. <laughs> <laughs> I did tell you, I don't know if I told you this, um, my good friend Dan Palmer, um, mm. uh, he, when he got married, we were already lucky enough to be at his wedding and uh, his father-in-law gave a talk, as they do, and because uh, his wife, his, uh, wife is a South African, Amanda. And the father-in-law says uh, he comes into Australia um, through customs. And uh, the, the uh, customs official says to him, um, sir, have you ever been in prison? And he goes, well, coming here, I didn't know that it was a prerequisite. <laughs> And spending t any time with Ellen Savory, uh, you immediately realise who are the superior antiquities. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. He doesn't let you forget. No. So, <laughs> um, <So> proceed. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So, so Johan, uh, so there's a few people who are saying we need high utilisation and there's a lot of people saying we need low utilisation. Um, you need to think this through and see what happens in your environment. So this is from Alan's book. So uh, this is among millions of plants. The horse had grazed for one hour, but it had severely grazed one, a plant that it liked. So they are selective grazers. So we need to be aware that they are selective grazers, that they will find a plant that they like and chew it nearly all the way to the ground. and then. Uh, I noticed this when we're shifting uh, cows through a gate. If the first one takes quite a few big bites out of it, then someone behind them will also go, oh, that's a good one, and take it right down to the ground. So that now becomes the plant that you have to monitor for. So when we're monitoring, we need to monitor the most severely grazed plant. So if one of your best grasses has been severely grazed, I say then you should take down most of the grasses to severely graze because you can't come back until that best grass is recovered or better grass. I do like best, but the, you know, that whole idea that if they've, that's now your benchmark. So leaving the others with lots of leaf area is going to cause this problem where you've got some that aren't getting used and then they'll become staler and staler. They, um, uh, start getting oxidizing and things like that and then you'll be killing the ones that they are severely grazing so we try and even up that so that we're getting it quite um, Alan's analogy is clearing the smorgasbord uh, so we clear the smorgasbord so that we can come back with fresh plants all over the whole paddock I go to quite a few farms and they're like um <laughs> running on 50% of the land surface because half of the plants are unpalatable because they've got too stale and the animals won't eat them and the others are getting flogged um, uh, and have gone um, really uh, uh, sort of either killing them and then starting to slide down into annual weeds. So you'll see in that paddock, you will see this combination of the grasses being killed from overuse, which tends to lead to annual type weeds for all type weeds 
or and you'll also see those other ones that are dying from over rest so a different mechanism that's killing them their their growth points aren't being cleared and they're actually dying from being choked to death and they'll be tending to head to woody plants so when you go into these paddocks that aren't clearing the smorgasbord you actually see both ends of the spectrum so plants uh, weeds forming from overuse of some plants and weeds forming from underuse of other plants so we need to be starting to when we walk into a paddock start getting that stopping thinking um, and clearly trying to work out what is happening in here uh, if you've got thistles, forbs, cape weed, you're overusing them. The recovery is too short. If you're heading towards woody, you're not clearing those. So they're the two ends of it. So I, ha I, ha I sort of when I'm working with people, and it does drive them a little bit crazy, So, which just seems to be a skill, is that what I do is I say, look, I don't want to hear the story until I've sat there and thought about it and looked at it and measured it. So... I find that I can be more forensic if I haven't heard the story. Um, otherwise, I'm sort of empathising, um, which is in contradiction to what my wife thinks. But uh, I'm empathising with people sort of of why they've done that and I'm not forensic enough to help them. So I do that whole, uh, look, let me just go and measure it, think about it, sit in it for a while, walk through it. And then I, I can come back and we can go from there. Then we can say, well, this is what's happening. And now, okay, well, why is that happening? And how do we change it so that it doesn't happen again? So that order works better for me rather than hearing the story straight up. So um, if, if that makes sense. So this is another slide from uh, Alan's book of... Um, this is one of those jokes that didn't travel to America very well. I went to America to give a talk at uh, one of the um, field days over there and I said I'd taken Alan's book and uh, improved it. So um, they didn't think I was funny. So <coughs> this is the sort of that life cycle of a grazed plant. All I've done is I've crossed out the days because I'm saying in complexity you don't want the days in there influencing you uh, you have to work this out on your land with your aspect with your soil and I've drawn some yellow in the plant to try and represent uh, what I call fresh litter so um, leaf emergence has gone through and you've actually got fresh litter in the plant so the animals come along in that top left and uh, the mature plant ready to be grazed. So I'm saying it looks like an ungrazed plant. There's there's no cut off tips. It's um, uh, it's a good green colour. Uh, there's no evidence that it's been grazed before, and it's got fresh litter in it. So uh, Alan's definition is looks like an uh, an ungrazed plant, and I've added and contains fresh litter or fresh yellow litter. Uh, it's not a grey oxidised litter left over from last season. It's actually th through that. And I say it's ready to be grazed. So the top middle, the animals come in and severely graze it. Um, all our sheep, cattle, goats are severe grazers and we need to let them be severe grazers, not try and get them to come off is what I'm arguing. Um, so it's grazed at the plant, then um, top, but top right, it starts to use its root reserve energy. So it must have root reserve energy and it will have it if it's recovered fully. And it starts to put up leaf in that bottom left. So leaves are beginning to grow on energy. Um, I, I don't know whether that helps with, I'll just put the cursor on that one. The um, leaves are beginning to grow and then it starts. If the animal comes back there, the plant would be overgrazed. And you usually get a lot of animal health issues. So most of your metabolic animal health issues are from grasses that are too young. So if you're suffering from that, uh, you know, mineral deficiency, foot problems, scours in calves, a lot of those type of things uh, are driven by grass that's too young. So if you're getting that sort of impact, um, uh, it also, uh, the other one is low dung scores in, in the sheep and in the cattle. And that means that they can be in negative energy balance because they're trying to get rid of all the excess ammonia created from those grasses that are too young. So if, it, if their dung scores are low or you're seeing any of those animal health issues, it's screaming at you that the, you're giving them grass that's too young. 
and I say uh, immediately change. So get the dung scores correct. So um, give them some fibre, some straw or whatever to get the dung scores right. Shift them to a, an older paddock. Do something straight away. Um, you can, uh, if you give cows grass that's too young, you can start to get scours in the calves within a week and you can actually start to sort of start to, um, running them down and you know, getting you know, that sort of dying from pneumonia within a fortnight is my experience. So um, I'm trying to just say, tell people that so that they don't have to do what I did. So, um, so leaves are now converting enough sunlight to start to become energy positive. It's starting to now put back its roots. And now it's starting to put those roots back and then it goes to that. It's fully recovered. Uh, uh, all the roots have been re-established and it's starting to grow fresh litter and it's ready to be grazed again. So I added, I've added some of this drawing of the fresh yellow litter. I've tried to put a brown line in there as decomposing litter and, uh, and I've written down the bottom here contains fresh yellow litter. So I'm saying that uh, that's the cycle and you need to work out what, how long is that cycle. So, um, uh, how long is that cycle in your environment with your management, with your soil types? So um, there's no easy answer, but you do know what to look for. So the ungrazed plant and contains fresh yellow litter. So I'll come back to that a, a, a bit again. So, um, and make sure that uh, uh, if you have any questions on that, any of that sort of thing, I'm happy to take it at any time. So, um, uh, so some of the positives and negatives. So I'm advocating moving animals on gut fill, which is I'm, I'm, I use a gut fill score. So I look at the recovery of the grasses. Are they recovered before I put the animals in? Then when I put the animals in, I'm on a shift my focus from looking at the grass to looking at the animals. Uh, this is to make sure that we get animal performance and the gut fills an early warning indicator of animal performance. It leads uh, what we'd say in Australia's body condition score. So just that sort of, uh, we give them a score out of five and in the States a score out of 10. So are they gonna get the condition score that you need? So, um, so the positives, it uh, massively reduces the rainfall risk, which is the second highest risk in agriculture to, after debt. So it massively changes that it's because you're making sure that you're getting full recovery. Any little blips in, you know, interseasonal droughts, I've been thinking of them in my head, uh, where you get that sort of, like everything's growing all right, but you get a month with no rain, nothing falls apart if, you've, if the grasses are going well. You don't get that summer slump uh, that they get in, uh, that they talk a lot about in the States, because the plants have always got full root reserves, full energy, and you're linking up all that leaf emergence time. So um, a critical understanding of grazing management is to understand uh, how plants go through their leaf emergence. So uh, they emerge until they, uh, so perennial ryegrass is the, because we're near a dairy area, it's like my thinking tool. So it has three actively growing leaves and for the fourth leaf to emerge, the first leaf that emerged then dies and becomes litter. Most people go, oh, it's died. You know, like I go, yes, it's good. That's the way we, um, we actually feed the nutrient cycle in, uh, in grazing management. So um, we have to know when we've got to let things die, when we've got to keep them alive, that type of stuff. So cycling things. So it quickly increases landscape function. Uh, so stability, so less erosion high nutrient cycling, and I'll come back to some of that in water infiltration, and increases the better perennial grasses. If you utilize high, you do get slower recovery. So the recoveries are longer when you have high utilization. Not all animals are suited to this. Um, a lot of the high um, cow energy type cattle uh, that are designed for feedlots will not perform in this system. They just have too high an energy requirement. Um, so we've selected well away from those uh, and we're breeding for that sort of local adaption, but also that low energy requirement. I think it, if you need animals that have got a low energy requirement, it, it may only suit a breeding focus. So 
I'm not sure that trading works all that well if you're sort of regenerating the land properly. So I'd be really sort of thinking that through. If you had a, a, par a partnership with someone that produces, um, that uses low energy cows, and produces low energy cattle. So uh, then you could tr you could buy theirs, but I don't know how you'd buy out of the sale yards. Uh, a few of the people I work with, when they buy females sort of uh, commercially, they find that uh, within two years, they drop out of this type of management where you're, re um, where you're doing that. So, uh, you know, we keep a couple, but like you sort of, it's less than sort of what it's worth. So we only breed up now, we don't, uh, buy. If we're going to do anything, we might uh, bring them in for short periods of time, so adjust them or um, you know, or stockers, as they'd say in the states. So, so yeah. So there is positive and negatives. It's not straightforward, um, but uh, I do a fair bit of training here, where we get people to come here, and I can actually train people very, very quickly how to run grazing management because I only let them look at the things I want them to look at. So are the grasses recovered before they put them in? Okay, now the animals go in, now change your focus to the gut fills and the dung scores so that you can actually see um, what's going on. So we've done some research on this. So it's not just sort of um, what I believe or what I think. Um, I'm pretty harsh on people when they say, I believe those recoveries are too long, Graham. And I come back with, I don't care what you believe. This is what the research that we've done. You know, if you've got better research, show me and I'll change my point of view. So this is research we did with Stiper Native Grasses in Sydney University uh, when we were trying to increase landscape function. So we did 13 farms over two states, so over Victoria and New South Wales. And this is an example out of New South Wales. So the bottom one um, that my son's holding there that looks like chocolate cake, um, that was within two years, that was in a gateway. So it was bare before we started and it was like a, a light sand. You can see that's the, uh, the top one is the control and the bottom one is the treatment. So the control started in a better position than the treatment and then we massively changed that in two years. Just focusing on, you know, have the plants fully recovered and building it up from there. So like, uh, it, it, the change can be incredibly quick if we do the right things. So if I, I say to people, well, if you get a season every year, if you get a growing season every year, which um, uh, quite a few environments in Australia do, then the change should be within, um, uh, within a very short period of time. The, uh, uh, the words on the left is sort of what I use as our um, landscape goal for what we're managing towards. So, just that perennial grassland with a deep stable litter layer with visible fungal attack. That's what we're trying to do at that litter at the soil surface. It needs to be uh, colonized and under visible fungal attack, which requires that the litter's pushed onto the soil surface so it can be colonized. Uh, increasing mature perennial grass plants. So we want large bases. Uh, recent work I've done uh, you know, so a lot of the um, stiper members will have sort of 80% of, uh, uh, of each hectare or acre covered by uh, perennial grass plants and large bases. And then a lot of the other people are managing for um, sort of like a uh, or 10%. So like massive difference in just the plant area that's covering the ground. Uh, which increases all that stability, water infiltration and nutrient cycling. And more than 30 perennial grass species with a healthy age structure. So you need seedlings, you need young plants, you need mature plants. I used to have 75 perennial grass species, but it just didn't work. It was too far away. I can actually take, uh, it was too much of an aspirational goal. I can take people to paddocks on our place and show them the 30 perennial grass species. But uh, otherwise, uh, but the reason I was using that 75, 70, 76 was uh, um, uh, Robertson, who was uh, sort of an early settler in our, he, uh, in our area. That was what he recorded, that there was about 75, 76 uh, perennial grass species in southwest Victoria when, uh, when Whitefella came through. So, um, so, yeah, so that's our goal, but also, so to show and sort of like um, 
to show that sort of we've done the work, we know uh, how to do this, how to rapidly improve soil. That work that we did, um, usually the question comes up, what about the economics of doing this? So that little area was grazed at the average of the district stocking rate, so not above, not below, just at the average. Uh, but only in, uh, I think it had two to three uh, episodes of grazing in that two years. Um, so, but at, at very high stock density. So you just, you've still got the same number of animals, you're just using them in a different way and giving this in, uh, recovery for the perennial grasses. So um, getting back to that complexity and what we have to do, uh, I have a, 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 I keep saying to people, we need to practice this to make sure that we know what we're doing. This is probably, a, I hope this isn't too busy, but I'm saying what I do is if this, each of these represents one of our little practice areas, I put in all the different types of grazing that people are talking about. So uh, in holistic management plan grazing, we talk about fast growth, fast moves. Uh, then we've got the eat the top third, leave the fifth, leave 50% of the leaf crew. Uh, we've got others that are talking about mixing it up. Uh, I'm saying more using perennial grass phenology, so that leaf emergence rates. And then we have other people that are just use a long, almost a, a, a like an annual cycle, which works really well. Um, it may not be the op optimum, but it's very simple. And I say put put those in, put in sort of small areas, and I'll talk about the photos below, and then do what people recommend. So this one we talk about, uh, graze it well, but don't graze it too well, and I've been trying to work out, well, what, what's that actually saying to people? So I've just gone for, say, moderate utilisation. Um, this is low utilisation, so this is the, uh, the other one that would fit in here would be the tall grass grazing. They leave quite a lot of leaf area. Uh, I'm saying it's low utilisation. Then mix it up, sort of sometimes high, sometimes low. Um, this one that I do, which tends to be as high as I can possibly get it while getting animal performance. So that's moving on gut fill. So sometimes it might be more variable than I've actually written there. And then this one, if you're only going around once a year around the paddocks, then you, you tend to use them really well when you go through. If you don't use them really well, you'll lose the species. But the other thing, as you build up that litter, it'll start to clog up the system unless you trample it quite well so that it's uh, in contact with the soil surface and able to be colonised. So this is on a sheep property. Um, I hope that's okay on the screen. That um, It's quite a, uh, it's quite a, um, you know, like it was a lot of grass. It was fence high when we went in. Um, uh, Marianne put the uh, sheep in, in the middle photo um, and, uh, and sort of trampled it down. So she wasn't sure she'd be able to get the sheep in there. That was the grass was that thick and that heavy. And then she came out uh, and left it when it was all um, uh, on the soil surface. So she put uh, ewes and lambs in there. She was a bit surprised. And then the lambs wanted to play in there afterwards. They didn't want to come out, you know. So there was, uh, so there was a lot of things happening sort of in there about animal behaviour and teaching them that. What we find is that ours will run and, and mob up because we graze them as a mob all the time. They're much happier and healthier and more relaxed if they're all together. So if I try and separate one, it'll, it'll climb the fences to get back into the mob. Um, and then sort of leaving the ground covered, I hope you can see sort of in that third photo on the right that the ground's covered, there's been really good utilisation but you haven't bared it off. You've left litter on the soil surface. You haven't made the animals eat, eat the litter. They've only eaten the green leaf in effect and pushed everything else onto the soil surface. So that creates the condition. So the point of this was to say, you need to confirm this yourself. I'd be going to uh, what I do, but you know, that's what I do. So, um, you know, we get locked in a little bit. Um, uh, so I'm happy, but like, Confirm for yourself what works for you on your land, with your management, with your animals. Um, in the less brittle environments, in a lot of the states, you can get away with a bit more of the eating the top third and things like that. They're very, they're very robust, resilient, forgiving environments. In uh, most of Australia and Africa and uh, sort of 
Ethiopia, that Western US, they're not robust, uh, non-brittle environments, and you need to be more focused on sort of getting that litter on the soil surface and making sure you grow it each time. This fits um, with the sort can of... I just, um, can I just interrupt yeah. you for a moment, yeah, please? Sure. Um, I've got a question from Adam McLean, who you might remember did the Rex with us the last one yeah, um, in Canada, I, yeah, in Prince Hi, Edward Island. Yeah, um, he's on Facebook and he's just asking, um, let's, uh, let's say the animal is not yet adapted to a lower energy phenotype um, and the ration needs energy input to achieve production goals to balance lower energy pastures. <clears throat> is it possible to feed grain in a way that doesn't impact animal forage or intake digestion slash digestion? I've been looking into some research saying that animals eating small amounts of grain often through the day, six to eight times, can make better use of mature forages. I'm interested in your take on that as a possible transitional strategy to, yeah. lower, to a lower energy livestock phenotype. Great. Great question, Adam. You can, and you're right, because the uh, the slug feeding of grain, say in our dairying in Australia, is it just it knocks the uh, the rumen pH that hard that uh, they actually go from I can't remember the names of it. It's like that sort of from, um, but like let's just say from processing grass to pro processing starch. So. Uh, I'll have to look up my notes, but I've got a fair bit of stuff on that. And if you, you can do that, but again, it's one of those things, it's a high risk. It'd be something you'd have to check to make sure that it was in context for you. I'd be more inclined if you could get access to, uh, you know, while you're transitioning and still getting animal performance, like if you had your own brand or whatever, I'd be looking at maybe using like um, a high quality hay or something right that rather than grain because you know that that's not going to do it and then just uh, that's not going to damage the the ph of the rumen and stuff as well but mm -hmm. it'd be really you can do it but it, it sort of would be well is that within context of what you're trying to do okay. um, well he has got a point here which he started with obviously depending on local grain economics but you're also saying that if you're using high quality hay well and that would factor in as well in your in your balancing of all of this, yeah, and and I, I'd again, I'd be I'd be setting up and doing the work, saying, oh well, you know, until I get there and get those uh, the right types of animals, what am I going to do? Which one fits better with what I'm trying to do? So, you know, when we're direct marketing our beef, we say that it hasn't eaten grain, so it's not an option for us in that. So. Um, and uh, yeah, like and yeah, like and then we try and manage in a way that we never have to feed, never run out of grass. So the other thing is, as the land's improving and the animals are adjusting, and you're selecting for that body condition score at calving, um, if we, if you've got cattle, um, so that's what we use as our measure. The animals all calve down and run the same all the time together. So their can body condition score at calving is one of our sorting tools. Um, so uh, I, I actually sort of, if you're using gut fill, you can actually still get performance when the animals aren't, um, aren't locally adapted and haven't come across to that lower energy type, um, but you won't get the utilisation. So there'll be a cost in doing that. So your stocking rate would be lower and you'd be moving more frequently based on the gut fills. So. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yep. I've got another question here from Shannon Kelly, which is a little related, I suppose, uh, in the sense of um, utilisation again and disturbance. Um, I know this question is variable depending on your context and distinct situation, but how can we work with that special beast of grass, Kikuyu, in this approach? How can we manage it to encourage diversity and species especially deeper perennials. So I'm guessing that would be um, really uh, a question of impact. And uh, if, you're, yeah. if, you, if you're not getting that impact on the landscape, then you're not giving other species a, a, an opportunity. There's a lot of people, especially if you, uh, if you, if you apply tall grazing or, or have less utilization, use the, uh, the types here that you've got where you're saying fast growth, fast moves, leave 50% eat top, eat top third with Kikuyu, well, you're just going to support Kikuyu. Yeah, yeah. And um, 
And one of the things is if you don't have any of those better successional grasses to see if they would have recovered, it's got to be longer than what you think uh, the current one is. So another one we run into, um, and I'll get back to the Kaku, that, uh, is, is Phalaris. So um, it'll tend to dominate. It's a lower successional species in our environment, which shifts by environment. Um, but yeah, so what we find is we have to impact it deeper. Um, and then make sure we give it enough recovery. So if you impact it deeply, you're going to get that um, that soil to seed contact from the hoof action of. So you'll germinate the viable soil seed bank, and then we need to let that seed that's germinated within there establish, so that uh, before we come back again. So. Um, I do uh, a fair bit of this and, and again, it'd be the practice areas that you know, sort of, how can you do this so that you're not putting the business at risk? So um, Dave Snowden had called them safe to fail um, trials or, or practices areas. So that this, you know, so you just, you doing this, I'd do a similar thing with the Kaiku. I, I would wait until it was uh, sort of recovered and looking uh, fully mature. Then I'd trample it, then I'd lock it up and leave it. And maybe one of the things is that sometimes early on, uh, like to get our uh, summer growing native grasses back, we have to give it 12 months recovery. But we find that out by having a range of different recoveries in these practice areas. And I think that's sort of the only way to sort that out. So in so your so you, environment... So, so they would need multiple practice areas side by side in order to get the, the treatments? Oh, yeah, or, or just even two. So, you know, yeah. like I, you could, you'd do one at six months, one at 12 months, and, I, yeah. and as long as you trampled them well, you, the answer will usually pop out. You'll see, you'll see trends and tendencies within that that then you can use to sort of change and modify your management elsewhere. So. Okay, all right, well, we'll move along. And uh, thank you to Shannon for your question. And uh, Enrique said, welcome. Oh, hello from Spain. So... Oh, hello, <laughs> very early in the morning there, or yeah. late at night. So, yeah. thank you, Graham. Thanks, uh, Darren. I'll, this is just a, a paper out of, um, uh, so just out of Texas. So, um, and they compared short duration grazing. I'm, I'm not sure that we've got the wording right for all of this. So, short duration I find leads to moving the animals on too quickly and not getting enough uh, utilization. So the people, if you say short duration to them, they go, I can't stay. When I'm saying the grass isn't finished, the animals are still full, like they're not showing any need to move. Why are you moving them? And they get that urge to move. And I'm going, no, no, it's actually you've got to stay and clear the smorgasbord so you freshen all the plants. You've got to get enough trampling to get the litter on the ground. You've got to get enough hoof action, that twisting hoof action to create germination sites. You need to stay. And something about that language doesn't lead to staying. So um, I think, uh, um, and like this is a sort of a research term, but I think that high intensity, low frequency is more what I'm talking about. So, and in that, in that research, um, it actually says that the, the short duration grazing did not promote succession to better grasses or from short grasses to mid grasses, as, as well as the high impact, uh, low frequency system did. And that's so, very interesting. Um, when I did the Rex program in uh, Mexico in 2016, we had a number of graziers who were very uh, managing really large scale landscapes in the Chihuahua and Sonora in Northern Mexico. And, you know, some of them had 20,000 acres sort of scale. And they'd shifted, they'd been long time holistic management planned graziers and that worked okay. Um, but then they shifted to Johan Seitzman's methods, which is very much in, in sync with what you're looking at here. Shorter, shorter duration um, and higher intensity, high utilisation, but then really long uh, but then really long recoveries, which for their environment was much longer than what they were working with before. I think they were going up to 18 month recoveries and yep. the impact overall um, was uh, like they were all, they were all completely sold on that as being a, as a better way of going um, yeah. in terms of species diversity, palatability, 
um, you know, growth rates, body condition, all of those, all of those metrics of success were, were being realised as a shift from what was a pretty good system to one that was just going up to another level. Yeah, fantastic. And I, um, I'd, I'd like to be really clear. I'm not suggesting long recoveries. What I'm suggesting is recoveries long enough. And it sort of, I know it might sound like a, a mute point, but I'm, I'm saying that work out what this is that gets you the outcome that you're after. So you know, I, I found that uh, just due to the variability, you've got to do the work. And so I've been finding that, uh, like out at Cobar, Darren, that uh, they're similar. Some sometimes their their eighteen months sort of practice areas are actually the best thing that they've got on the place. Yeah, so it is very so, much a relationship, and this is why you need to be a grass professional. You need to understand completely the physio. You know, it's not just looking at the livestock physiology, but it's also looking at the grass, the physiological responses in the grassland. Yeah. Yep, for sure. And I think that that's what we need to, so reading up on leaf emergence rate, sort of seeing what's all those things, actually doing the work, your animals, assessing where they are, looking at what other people are doing. Um, a really, uh, like a, uh, oh, the kids would say a hack, I suppose. The, um, a really quick, quick way of, of working out uh, when you go to someone else's farm, whether they're getting that combination of animal impact and recovery right is to go near the uh, water point in the next paddock that they're going to be going into. The grass should be better near the water than it is further away from the water. When grazing's degrading, the grass will be better further away from the water. When grazing is regenerative, the grass will be better near the water point or the gateway. So can you, just un you, can you just unpack that hack? Please, uh, Graham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so um, in a uh, in a continuous grazing or an ad hoc rotation, um, you actually get more wear near the water. So the animals are spending more time there. The plants aren't getting a cha a chance to recover. So, as you move away from the water point. Uh, in the literature, they call this the pyosphere around the water point. So the, uh, the, the, the ring around the drinking area, really. And as you move out, the grasses get better because they're not getting as worn as the other ones closer to the water point. So you'll get a big bare area near the water point, then you'll get some weedy things, and then eventually you'll get into grasses just spread out. And it's about the time that they spend on that. Once you change to planned grazing, what you find is, and it's in Alan's book as well, is what you find is near the water point where they've had more impact, uh, more dung and urine, uh, all those good positive things, and then you've allowed it to recover, you'll get better grasses, more vibrant growth, um, sort of like if you uh, yeah, near the water point than you do further out from the water point. So... It's really, uh, it's a quick way of checking sort of how things are going. And then the next thing my, um, uh, you know, my eye jumps to is, is, is the annuals, uh, um, annual forbs and weeds type plants. Are they increasing or decreasing? Are they an issue? Uh, and I question people about that. And then the next jump is, have they got oxidising uh, perennial grass plants so that aren't getting their growth cleared because they'll have a tendency to shift to woody plants over time. So so it's that sort of whole thing. So um, just those quick things as you walk on. And it's really powerful to have them in your kit bag when you walk on because, and then I don't give people a flogging by saying, well, I try not to. Some people are disagree. <laughs> Well, I, I have noticed your cat. I have seen that cat of nine tails in your <laughs> kit bag, Graham. What, what I try to do is say, well, why, why is this happening and what's the cause and how do we address that and make sure that it doesn't happen the next time? So it's not that it's you know, not going well now. It's, well, how do we fix it sort of and move on? Yeah. It's highly complex to be critical of people, I think, is really pushing it. So, um yeah, so I'm trying to leave the cat and nine tails at home. So, um, yeah, so uh, so there's research. 
I have a rule of thumb. Dave Snowden talks about these rules of thumb for managing complexity. So when I'm confused, so like this is such a complex area that you can get confused about, well, what's happening here? This is our rule of thumb. We reduce the stocking rate because we want to increase perennial grass recovery. And at the same time, we push them up tighter. So we increase stock density at the same time. So, um, so it's sort of like, uh, I call it sort of, uh, I can't say heuristic, but so I just call it the uh, rule of thumb. So, so can you see what I'm trying to do there? So when in doubt, I go and look at my practice areas. What are they telling me? What's happening? Sort of try and use, interpret those as a, as a portfolio, sort of. So drive around, think deeply, go slowly, get, go into that slow thinking sort of mode. Um, what are they trying to say to me, all the practice areas? But if I'm still confused, I go to reduce stocking rate, increase recovery, but also increase the impact through increasing stock density. So we have fencing systems that allow us to do that. So um, a bit breezy outside. So, so is there any other questions at that stage, Darren? I was um, I've got uh, from Elaine, uh, who is with her husband, uh, Marcus, um, did a Rex with us in Chile and they did also on the Regrarians team on the Regrarians workplace. Um, they've got about, uh, I think about three or 4,000 hectares in Brazil um, mm -hmm. and do holistic management work there with their cattle operation, family operation. Um, Alan's asked, um, usually we measure our success and in, uh, I think dollars per hectare, which obviously says nothing about sustainability or increasing land quality. What you think, what, uh, I think it would be, what, what do you think would be a great measure of performance in a holistic management approach that would be easy for a farmer to compare with others with a similar context? This would be great for economic decisions. Yeah. Um, so I, I have no no problem with measuring um, measuring the profit. So mm. it's got to be uh, it's got to be sort of money in the bank profit. Uh, mm. I find that some of them are a little bit too short. So um, so um, people aren't going all the way through. So is the bank account increasing or decreasing? Is a fantastic measure. Um, and the other one is that uh, is sort of is the landscape function. I was going to do a little bit. If we had time on that yeah. as well, Darren. Well, maybe we'll, um, well, maybe we'll just park that, and because um, yeah. there is a fair bit in that, and um, we'll continue yeah. on, and we'll and we'll park that the rest of that question for some of the other things that you've got coming up. Yeah. So, um, because there are a whole range of different measurements for success that uh, that are very, very much based on. Oh, they're quite subjective in a lot of ways. There's objective success markers, but then, like you've put out, there's you know bank account size, but then I'd look at that and go, well, part of my context might be that I'm using, that I might keep my bank account at a stable level because I'm putting capital into my landscape. Uh, yeah. You know, putting in, you know, putting in improvements that you might be in that phase. So, yep. um, so, and, so therefore, yeah. so therefore changes in stocking rate or performance, uh, uh, those or pounds or kilograms of production per hectare might be what give you that uh, what what might be that metric. Anyway, yeah. we should proceed because uh, yeah, we'll, I'll, we'll, we'll park park that I'll, in the past. I'll, I'll just I'll just skip uh, forward to this landscape function. So this yeah. is this is the um, the basis of biodiversity. So this is that stability, infiltration, and nutrient cycling. This is work done by uh, our CSIRO in Australia, so uh, David Tongway and Norm Hindley. And what they were asked is that sort of at the next rainfall, is the land going to erode or be stable? Is the water going to infiltrate or run off? And is it going to um, result in nutrient cycling or a burst of growth? And this is the relationships between it all. But the, the three to look at are those top three or four. Uh, so is it covered? What's the area of the ground covered by the basis of the perennial grasses? It's got litter between the perennial grasses and how is that decomposing? So this is what I use as my whole um, measure of success. If that isn't increasing, I'm saying we're not, we're not uh, managing holistically. 
Um, so I really go uh, hard on this. This is, uh, oh, I've been saying blue ribbon sort of science. It's practical, it works in practice. So is the ground covered? Is it increasing in perennial grass basal area or the large bases? And is the litter decomposing in the intertussic space? The difference between agriculture that's degrading and regenerative is what's happening between the plants. Is it got decomposing litter between the plants? If it doesn't, you don't get that nutrient cycling. It's a short lived sort of uh, carbon source, that litter, um, but it provides the fuel for the nutrient cycling. See, there's a line from 3B down to new nutrient cycling, that blue line. I want David to put a few more lines in there, but he, he said that was enough. The, um, so it's that what's happening to the litter between the plants and is it decomposing and is the basis of the perennial grasses getting larger leading to that nutrient cycling so that's the water infiltration that litter and soil covers the stability this is what we're doing out in a grassland and so if you have a, a financial uh, target you've also got to have this uh, landscape function target um, Alan's uh, biological monitoring is based on the same science and it's from the same root uh, and it's simpler. So unless when you throw the dart and measure the distance to the nearest perennial, I'd just be thinking about a few of the other things that uh, David Tongway picked up was that you know, being really clear about the degree of decomposition and how big are the perennial grasses, you want them to be getting bigger. So this is also um, applies for trees in pastoral landscapes. So one of the, um, one of the things I, so I do this bit of a rant thing about we've gone too far on the trees and um, sort of try and stir people up. I work with a lot of people that cannot think of an area that wouldn't be better with a tree in it. And there's a lot of areas that aren't better with trees in them. So it's quite confusing for people, but I'm saying at its core, what I'm trying to make that statement for, and I, I do ridiculous things like, you know, the, and it's not quite true, but we only stood up because of the perennial grasslands. So, you know, why do you want, you know, do you want to get back up in the trees and do all that sort of stuff and muck around with people? But at its core, what I'm saying is go into your treed area, what is happening on the soil surface? Because it's what's happening there that tells you whether you're degrading or regenerating. Not the plant, not the tree, not the perennial grass. What's happening between them, it tells you whether you're doing a good job or not. So if you don't have full soil cover in a forested area and it doesn't have decomposing litter, you know, all the bark and leaf litter, then it's not healthy. You need to take action. So I'm trying to engage with people on that type of thing. <laughs> and I find that I don't always succeed because uh, somehow we've gone to trees will save the planet. And that's just not true. In some places it will, in some places it won't. So I'm not surfing um, the whole trees thing. So if it's a forest and it's got areas that doesn't have full ground cover, leaf and Good, um, good decomposition of the litter, then it probably needs to be a grassy woodland or a grassland and managed with ruminants more. So we need to work out where it is on that brittleness scale, how much rainfall, is there enough rainfall to produce enough litter? What's that sort of decomposition rate? So, uh, you know, one of the things in uh, Mediterranean environments, we burn a heap of litter because the growth is stopping when the temperatures are highest. So the, the, uh, the litter keeps decomposing, but we're not topping up. In those summer growing grasslands, we're actually providing litter at the height of the highest decomposition rate. So we're growing plants. So um, I can come back to that if I haven't said that clearly. So this is the foundation of biodiversity. And that leads me back um, if I can, back to sort of that to legume or not to legume. So apart from just saying... Before you, just before you launch yeah. into that, Graeme, um, one, of the, one of the really interesting pieces for that in, for me in this as being one of, uh, as uh, Dave Snowden would call, a, a rule of thumb, is that I find that this whole landscape function analysis um, uh, is, is one of those rules of thumb in a sense. 
mm-hmm. because um, there was a point that uh, I don't know if you remember or if you saw it, uh, Stephen Barrow um, had in the Regrarians workplace where he was, as a soil scientist, was um, somewhat critical of this approach because he looked at it and said, well, you know, what about, what about what's happening underneath the ground um, in terms of showing us what landscape function there is and, uh, you know, what effect... It, it, so I'd have to I'd have to go and look at the question directly, yeah, yeah, no, but I, I, I read it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so is this is this a bit simplistic? But then when I the way I look at it and think is well, um, if your primary objective is to try and manage the complexity of trans of transforming your own journey from where you are to where you want to go don't go and burden yourself with too much analysis. That's the way I would look at it in that it's really important for you to just get these bases right. Yes. And then you can start because otherwise you're going to disappear down all sorts of different rabbit holes. And believe me, if you, if you don't already realize this, if you want rabbit holes, well, that's, that's biology 101, (laughs) right? That's, you know, there's, that's why there's no laws of biology um, because it's impossible to create a law because it's too complex. So, you know, the, from, from my perspective in uh, as someone who um, has taken this stuff on, um, it's, it, it simplifies your life when you, when you, when you use kind of rule of thumb approaches such as this landscape uh, function work that, uh, um, that Graham's put forward through, through Mr. Tongway. Um, another point I'd make about that is I've been watching a few people um, speak about the use of earthworks um, as an alternative to this. I look at it as sort of like cause and effect, a cause and effect discussion. Let's use earthworks, let's put in swales and let's put in, you know, do use key line ploughs, let's use all of these devices as opposed to management. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that it's pretty clear to me, and uh, it also goes with the tree comment too, Graham, that um, you know, a lot of people have talked about planting trees in recharge zones to try and increase infiltration. Um, and that works in some situations, but the evidence is quite clear, I know, from work that the... Uh, Centre for Land Protection Research did here in Victoria back in the 80s and 90s of putting perennial grass lands back because all of those landscapes had annualised, putting perennial grasslands back up onto recharge areas, they found that the recharge rates were actually much higher than the tree than the adjacent tree plantings on the on the same on the same sites, which all feeds into Mm-hmm. A lot of what you're talking about here. I mean, we look at five arrows going towards infiltration, um, yep. and it's cost it's cost positive to get this kind of infiltration happening. It's a byproduct of a production system. Whereas if you go out and spend money on earthworks and pulling iron through the ground, well, that's not necessarily cost. That's that's something that's probably a, a capital cost to you. Yeah. Yeah. I- yeah, that's really clear, Darren. I um, I have this sort of I believe in sort of escalating. So start with the lowest risk, most profitable thing you could do to fix yeah. a problem, and then escalate up from there. So if that doesn't work, go to the next one. Um, all right. The, uh, the other the other thing, just quickly on that sort of soil and what's happening below the ground, I. Whenever I've worked with people, I find that it's a bit like that that comment I made about if you use the wrong words like short duration, people are focused on that. Mm-hmm. Whenever I've done a lot of work with soil kits and that, people think what can they add or what can they do to that to that subsoil um, when I want them to actually change their management as the first step on the soil surface. So I'm not saying it's like my disliking trees and legumes i'm trying to gain and get attention for people How, are you looking at the right things have you thought that through which is what you described really well so yeah um but along the way it does upset people but uh I, well uh, that's if you're there to be upset i mean some <laughs> yeah. people some people some people enjoy debate some people when there's a debate to be had they they get defensive and go into their shell that's more a reflection of them than you. Yeah. Anyway. This is, um, 
So the legumes, again, uh, I feel like we've really overdone the legume thing. So um, uh, we've probably got that out. So this is this uh, um, map of the world is about the planetary boundaries. So what have what have we busted, and uh, how are things going? So uh, I think Will Stefan, um, it's on Wikipedia. I've, I've dropped the reference off that. Sorry, but it was uh, that picture's out of Wik Wikipedia. So if you you put in planetary boundaries, this should come up. But the areas that we've really done some damage are genetic diversity, uh, so up the top there at the left, and also nitrogen, so the biochemical flows. So, you know, we, you know they're saying that climate change, when they did this work, and ocean acidification weren't too bad compared to uh, loss of species and nitrogen, and also that phosphorus. We've clearly, to my mind, broken the planetary boundary for how much nitrogen we should have in the system. In Europe and in other areas, they're starting now to do mass balance equations and things like that. And you can only put on this much nitrogen and all that sort of stuff. So most people think of uh, um, sort of industrial nitrogen or sort of bagged nitrogen, I've been calling it. But I'm saying it, once you know that we've broken this biochemical um, flow of nitrogen and that we're acidifying soils, polluting waterways, and doing it, you've really got to stop using nitrogen. So in the same way, you know, we've got to stop getting having extinct species, we've got to stop using a focus on nitrogen. So what can we do about that? So um, it, uh, it's not a great plant. Um, uh, yeah, like it's effectively comes under landscape function as annual litter, it acidifies the soil and it leaks nitrate, which is a carcinogen. So I go, otherwise it's all good, you know. So anyway, these legumes, uh, what happens is if we add nitrogen um, and fix too much nitrogen, we get this top slide. So this is out of a research paper uh, by Leakey et al. Um, I think they're Canadians, I'm not sure, sorry. Um, but you set up these pathways where you actually end up with too much ammonium and too much nitrate and the nitrate leaches out. That's what acidifies the, the soil, but it also pollutes the water. So adding and having too many legumes, you set up these really bad cycles where the plants actually stop working as hard because they don't need to uh, um, feed as much of their uh, liquid carbon to the soil. So you end up getting all these bad pathways and setting it up. So if you add it through that path, it doesn't do that. If you add very low levels, you basically shut down the ammonium and nitrate and you start to hold it as organic nitrogen and in, in the, uh, the soil, the microorganisms and fauna. So you still have uh, access. There's research showing uh, that this doesn't have to go through mineralization to feed the plants in high landscape function areas. So in really healthy grasslands, in really healthy forests, the pathway doesn't leak nitrogen or nitrate. So it doesn't cause all these problems. So we need to focus on increasing the landscape function rather than thinking that a plant, that there's clear evidence um, I, I think alfalfa or, or uh, lucerne is a really classic example. So it's a plant that ends up um, managing the farmers so that they end up with bare ground between the plants, no landscape function. It's acidifying the soil, it gets compacted, it's uh, leaking, you know, uh, carcinogen, Do you know, like, and, and it kills the cows. Otherwise, I go, yeah, yeah, otherwise it's a beauty. It's a two thumbs up. Like it doesn't make sense from my point of view to be even thinking that a species is gonna help us. It's that managing for that complexity of that perenniality and landscape function that's gonna help us rather than, oh, what 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 are you going for a winter growing loose or, or a summer? Yeah, you know, like it just doesn't make sense to me. So um, I've been- Bradley, are, you, are, you, are you familiar with the work of Bill Twig at all? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So you you will have seen um, his his pastures. I'm I'm assuming, therefore. Yeah. So Bill's sort of northwest of you, isn't he? Yeah, He's serpentine area. Yeah, serpentine. Yeah. But he he has a lot of dry land um, loosen, But it's uh, I, I, the way I look at the um, with sheep grazing, 
the way I look at that, that's not a bad utilization of loose and alfalfa, as others would call it, because it's a, it's not, it's it's a grassland that's not dominated by it, and that's what a lot of people, you know, a lot of people yeah. have loose as being the species, and will manage the landscape for that, yeah. and therefore it domesticates them, yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> versus an approach like Bill, where um, the loosens actually are just a component of the grassland, not not the dominant yeah. species. It's probably yes. it's probably yeah. the way I look at Bill's. It's probably it's probably ten percent. Obviously, yeah. your eye sees it, but most of it's perennial grasses. Yeah, and that's yeah. So I usually say five percent, sort of mm-hmm. around about five percent. All these sort of non. Uh, non-grass plants can add up to a total of 5% in mm-hmm. a grassland mm-hmm. and it won't set up these pathways of leaking uh, leaking nitrate so um, and and sort of shutting down the normal cycles so uh, so what uh, what I'm saying is that as a small component you know you need to go out and look on uh, healthy native grasslands sort of go and look for what is that sort of that uh, nitrogen fixing component um, there's a real issue too, is that if you get too much of these high protein feeds in a diet, what happens is the animals scavenge for energy and fiber. So they'll take all the perennial grasses out. So if you've got too much salt bush, too much leucina, uh, too much lucerne, too much clover, too much, yeah, too much of these things, you end up destroying the landscape function because the animals are scavenge all the grasses out of there. Mm. And so you need to, um, it needs to be a perennial grassland with a bit of diversity in it rather than um, um, the other. We're doing, the one of our research trials that we're doing here is running with no legumes. So managing that we do not have legumes because most people think the world will stop. Um, uh, we've got too many blue gums around us to do it similar with trees, but we could uh, you know, just <laughs> so running without legumes. Now I've been saying oh, I'm pretty confident it doesn't fall apart because this is what this whole pathway is about. Mm. If you don't have legumes in the system, and and then just recently uh, some work that Christine Jones sent through to me, and in lo and behold, in that work. Um, I just come back, so I'm going to send it to everyone at the Farmers for Climate Action thing that gave me a hard time. So this is showing that if you get a uh, diverse perennial grassland, it'll it'll increase soil carbon and nitrogen without legumes. Mm. So, um, so so the work's done. It's just if we're not interested in it because. I tried to stack in a comment there of a photo I have from an article I wrote uh, last year, Graham which is another part of this whole nitrogen thing, which you alluded to, is that a a lot of people wouldn't realise how much energy it actually takes to make artificial nitrogen or bag nitrogen. And the figure actually is this, that it takes 1,000 cubic metres of natural gas to produce 711 kilograms of ammonia. So therefore, the average US corn crop uses the equivalent of between 2,000 and 5,009 kilo gas bottles um, to, to per hectare of yeah. crop, yep. which is an insane, if you put all those gas bottles <laughs> out, I mean, it'd basically cover the paddock. I don't, yeah. I don't know that to be certain, but <laughs> well, actually pretty well, it'd be one, one gas bottle for every, every two meters. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Which is crazy. It's- yeah, it is. It's just that's that's not so. So at the other end of the spectrum, where people are using uh, urea or, or whatever to, um, I don't know what the figure is for urea. That was for anhydrous ammonia, but yeah. um, but notwithstanding, when you use that, there is going to be an additional um, whole other cost, which is insane. Yeah. Um, And people don't often talk. I know Paul Keating, uh, our past Prime Minister, was talking about this as a topic, um, that the the battle, because he's the head of the Asia Development Bank, and he was talking about the battle for nitrogen. Um, It's it's because so much of what we do in agriculture is built around um, this this way that legumes and nitrogen are used uh, in our agricultural systems, and it's 
set as he put us it's put it put forward it's setting us up for a bit of a a problem because of the competing uses for natural gas yep i i yeah it's sort of like conventional cropping so and we do know that you know i, I know gabe brown uses legumes and things to prime his soil but it's still like a it's an order of magnitude better than what sort of the conventional corn production is doing because he's not using um, uh, urea or... or uh, well, you're talking about a successional process too. I mean, using something that a lot of systems are highly depleted and if that's mm -hmm. where they are, then they may well need something. I mean, nitrogen is so labile. Um, yeah. but it's, you know, it doesn't hold on real well. It's so volatile, but there's 78% of what we're all breathing right now. So it's not as if there isn't any. Um, yeah. It's a matter of us maybe getting a little bit, and it's similar to phosphorus. Maybe you've got really, really low levels of phosphorus, and a little bit might be enough to just get you going. But then let the biology take over, yeah. which is ultimately the point that you're making, I think. And yeah. this new article points out as well that uh, you don't need the legumes to get the carbon sequestration and therefore the growth. Yeah, and, and, and it's sort of, yeah, so it keeps, uh, it keeps catching up with what the, um, the regenerative farmers have been doing is the way it happens in my mind. The evidence just keeps stacking up. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so, um, but in, and eventually get to that high landscape function where most of it's being held as organic nitrogen or in the soil biota. So we need to feed it uh, to get it back. So, yeah, there can be a bit of a lag, but... Uh, so when we're working with people, we find that um, using Alan's financial planning, as well as sort of starting to shift the land uh, in a low risk, um, uh, regenerative way that you can actually transfer. I used to feel that people had to go through a bit of a, a, um, a dip, you know, to get come out the other side. And now we focus on making sure that no matter where they are, they just go straight up. They don't have to do the hockey stick. Um, and there's a real, uh, uh, Thing. I was just going to quickly finish with sort of some of the stuff we're doing just with our coaching and sort of what we've found is we've had to go to one-on-one -on -one webinars. Uh, if the, you know, people aren't too far away or they're, you know, within Australia somewhere, we're doing a, a, um, a, a farm visit combined with that. But focusing on simple plans based on people's barriers, not on sort of um, what what's going to work uh, sorry not based on what i think is going to work based on what they actually want it to do and what and how to make it work so that's working uh, that's working really well that change in focus uh this was a, a, a farm i was at uh, yesterday but this is some old photos sort of um from last year um and uh, yeah like massive shifts in landscape function and management and I just like the expression, I was rolling drunk with happiness. Um, I thought that was a pretty good comment. So, yeah, so it shifted a lot. So, um, so but if people wanted to do anything, I'd do like a phone call if people want to sort of explore that at, at all. So if you just wanted to drop me an email or something or let me know and I can contact you and um, we just do a phone call or a webinar where depending on where we are and just sort of go through. The webinar works best because I can actually sort of sort of pull up some things for people um and there's no charge to that what well, we're really focused on people's success um but and then if you know you're interested in the uh, that so i just had the the uh as a question and answer darren that was about all i had so hope that wasn't too much or not enough Unmute. Uh, there we are. Sorry, I just I thought I was talking, but I was talking, but no one was listening. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Um, when Lisa just brought uh, me my oh sorry, uh, 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 no, that's okay, Graham. <laughs> Lisa just brought me uh, my uh, my hot chocolate. So uh, oh, good mm, mm. and uh, exquisite as always. Um, so back to um, Elena. Um, I said, did we answer a question? And um, she said, sort of. I was thinking about a similar, um, she's used an ampersand uh, per hectare, the at symbol per hectare. So I'm going to suggest that that's dollars um, or uh, maybe it's a factor. I might get Elena to uh, clarify that for me. But anyway, I was thinking about a, a figure per hectare relation, but 
with other variables that would say more about the increasing about the increasing quality of your soil related to cattle performance but that's okay I know it all depends deeply on context. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I go to quite a few properties that their, their, their bank balance or their dollars is going up, but the land's going down. So mm -hmm. if you've, got, you've got to have those three things. So the money, the people and the environment shifting all in the one, mm -hmm. the one direction. So the people's quite subjective. And the first couple of times you ask people, you can get a bit of bouncing around. Mm -hmm. And I find, I found in, um, in partnerships or family situations that uh, the most accurate way I can get sort of how are they going is I had to separate them and then come back with their results because otherwise they were doing a fair bit of that, um, you know, if uh, if he went high, she went low or something like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 so yeah, a bit yeah, of that yeah, feedback. Yeah. So, yeah. but so we've been doing that sort of, you know, give us some uh, information and there's some really good tools for doing that. I think, the money's really important. I, I worry about people losing control of their land. And also, um, I think that there's a real, uh, uh, so, and, and a real need to have some way of doing that landscape function. You know, that litter needs to be building. You need, I'm not sure how you could manage it without some sort of uh, throwing the dart or a tool to know whether yeah. it's getting better or not. So you need that measurement I find it's like a scalpel, you know, I'll kid to myself that it's going okay. But when, uh, when you actually do it, you can, you can see clearly that maybe it's not. So, yeah. Yeah. I hear you. All right. Um, one of the things that uh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, in the absence of other questions coming forward, I think I got everyone. Um, I'm just waiting to see this show up on the screen. Here it is. Um, this is from one of our slideshows, which is based on um, the work of, why isn't that working? There we go. Um, this is from um, a slideshow that we have uh, as part of the Rex or, or part of our, one of our stump speeches, if you like, um, where I look at, uh, after Christine Jones's uh, five essential ingredients for soil formation process, uh, I've taken that on to say, all right, well, you need sun, air, water, you need biologically available minerals, um, you, need, um, you need living things in the soil mm -hmm. and you living, need living things on the soil. A lot of what we've talked about today has been living things on the soil and um, as being the conduit to feeding, all of, to, to feeding li living things in the soil. Yep. Then it's their actions, including the root system, because the plant is the one thing that lives above and below. It's the intermediary in all of this. Yep. So um, very clever organisms. So now this is a, uh, I'll just wait for you to come up on your screen, Graham, because I don't know how slow the lag is. Um, I've got this slide here, which I, um, this is from when we were producing the polyfaces film. Has that showed up yet? There's a cow. Yeah, yep, yep the cow there. Yep. Yeah, sort of a ro rony looking thing. Sort yeah, of. yep, yeah, beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Um, now that paddock there, this is when we were making the polyfaces film and uh, while the film crew were running around doing their thing, um, I, we, just, we just moved the cattle from, from what, it was about 700 cattle um, we'd opened up the fence and we did a bit of a time-lapse pan across the paddock to sort of show, all right, well, this is how relatively easy it is to move them. Um, yep. And so what I did was I went up and sat on the ground next to this cow as she walked up and started grazing this paddock or gra grazing this pasture and watched as at her head level uh, what, she, what she did. Because what she did was she ran, she ran as one of the cows in the mob. As they do, they went through the small gate or the opening. And then when they got through there, then they just dispersed as they do, yep. right? Yep. Then they all sort of work out what they're doing. Oh, we're in a new spot and yeah, this looks <laughs> yeah. all right. And have a little kick and a little frolic. And, oh, yes, that's right. We're graziers and I'm hungry. So, and this looks all right. So she sit, settles down and does that. 
And she does as exactly as you put it. She goes and um, actually in her case, she, as Joel Salatin calls it, the salad bar, not the smorgasbord, but she did go around in this pasture, which had probably about 25 species in it and uh, made her salad in her mouth and mm-hmm. then stood up and relaxed for a while and chewed that went, yeah, that's pretty good. I like that. I'll go and get some more of that. But in the meantime, because of the timing of this and because of the stock density, which is the, where I'm getting to here, that um, with the stock density that they had, this was the same area about 10 or 15 minutes later. Yeah. All right, with the same girl. And you can see the stock density there that's been managed um, as a result of that being the cell, the size of the fenced off area in that time. So... There, to me, that's, that's a lot of uh, under... Because they're moving once a day, so you can imagine that the utilisation is not going to be that great. What you've got here is a lot of, uh, a lot of material that's been trampled onto the ground. And which, well, so my question is, I suppose, do you think that this is uh, going to be something that's well utilised? Um, based on what you've seen here? Yeah to yeah. something that there that's yeah the so of half an hour or so yeah well i think with that sort of there's there's a number of things here sort of like the frequency of movement to get really good animal impact like johan and uh, neil dennis and gabe brown and what we do as well is it's incredibly frequent movement so like we're talking multiple moves per day so mm-hmm. um and it's very inconvenient without some sort of uh, system like a bat latch or design so that you're not opening the fence every time. Or uh, or but, something yeah. like this. This yeah, is like the, Abe the, Collins' the, the, uh, tumble wheels. And I see we've got, uh, we've got Julian Morley on here who uses that in South Australia as well, the tumble wheels. Yeah, and I, I think that's a, some of these things, these tools to make it easier are fantastic. So... Um, Utilisation you know, wise, utilisation wise, I'd say sort of you might have got some more green out of that, but I, I, I wouldn't have worried. I'd be looking at the cows. So, mm. so we need to get animal performance, and we could kept them there and made them eat more of it, but you might not have got your animal performance. So I'd be monitoring the gut fill scores and the mm-hmm. dung scores, mm-hmm. and I would have then moved them out based on that and then thought, well, what am I going to do differently next time? Am I going to do more frequent moves or less frequent moves or yeah. raise it yeah. at a different time of the year or, or whatever? So, um, yeah, so we, we, we'd approach it sort of from that gut fill and dung score, but it's the outcome that we're really got to be focused on. So, yeah. yeah. When I look at that previous picture, uh, to me, um, the animals would be very happy with that. Uh, you know, there's lots of legumes, and I think chicory and a few other yeah. things in there. Um, is that the best combination uh, for the soil, uh, for landscape function? Well, probably not. Uh, no, well, I, sh- I should, I should um, let you know that this is not one of... This is a leased block that Polyface have just taken on in a year. So this is both, it's not their pasture as it were. Yeah. Um, yep. Whereas when you go to Polyface, there's hardly any legume in it at all. It's mostly, mostly grasses and, yeah. and not, and non leguminous forbs. Yeah. So it actually gets really healthy and, yeah. and sort yeah. of stuff. And so, yeah, so it's that type of thing, but like, you know, if you, yeah, like Joel does his direct marketing. So, you know, and you needed animal performance. Well, that's where you are and that's what you react mm-hmm. to and sort of and shift it. Nudge it uh, is a real Dave Snowden sort of term. You nudge your management over time based on those portfolio of practice areas to get it to where you want it to go. Um, so, and you just continue monitoring. But like, um, yeah, most people would be very happy to leave that amount of uh, ground cover. Um, but it might have needed a little bit more and you might have, with multiple moves, you might have got a bit more utilisation and cleared it. But over time, is it shifting to those higher successional, more palatable, uh, longer season type uh, perennial grasses? If it's doing that over time, then it was probably okay. If it's not, then you'd have to modify it. And then I'd send people to doing some practice areas to work out, well, what is that combination of, 
animal impact and recovery. Mm. Yeah, I, I've shown this slide a lot over the uh, around the place and um, a few places. Like when, I, when I've been in New Zealand recently, quite a number of people said, "Well, that's a lot. That's a lot to leave behind." Yeah, um, and so. When you go to the other end of the extreme, I suppose, um, uh, Harry Weir, um, the guy who invented Kiwi Tech uh, fencing and water systems and techno grazing, um, one of his quotes is that, uh, I hope no one here will be offended, but my, my God is productivity. And so for him, uh, utilisation um, means that there's uh, very little left but then he still has a prolonged period of rest. So he mm. still gets the kind of recovery. But I think when I've looked at some of Harry's pastures, the amount of litter that's left behind is, um, is almost non-existent, which uh, yeah. I couldn't really get a... He seemed to not think that it was as important in a non-brittle landscape such as he's managing than... Um, than it is in a more brittle landscape. Well, that's the way he framed it anyway. I couldn't quite see that, but yeah, I didn't see did. that his landscape function was increasing as, as a result of that management. Yes, his yeah. utilisation was really high. Yes, his you know, other metrics of success were really high, financial success, you know, growth rates, all of those. Stocking, sort of rate. good, yeah. stocking rates were high yeah. and increasing. But when you looked at it in the sort of holistic um part uh, uh, through the length through a more holistic lens landscape function I didn't see was actually increasing as a result of that management yeah and I argue very strongly that Alan's work is about reversing desertification and increasing biodiversity if you're not doing it that then it's not holistic management and I see there's multiple ways of uh, increasing productivity um, and doing all those things. But I just don't see that if you're not increasing landscape function, I okay, that's fine, but you're not managing holistically. So yeah. you probably need to drop those words. And the, yeah. the, it sort of, yeah, and then the fight starts. So, yeah, sure. Yeah, so, <laughs> <bit late>. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so... Um, I don't, I, don't, I don't mind that if that it's so what I'm what I'm trying to say is you need to get animal performance and that's the, the most important thing if that's the best you could do today then that's fine next time how are you going to make it you know if you uh, determine that you need it to be better utilized so are you going to go to smaller paddocks are you going to go for different energy type cattle what are you going to do but like for today that would be fine sort of yeah. to take them out on the on an yeah. animal yeah okay good all right um uh julian mall said in the in the grand scheme of things legume inclusion is simply a short-term primer to help generate biomass yeah could be um i am not convinced uh, that that's correct i find that uh i was going to be cheeky about men <laughs> Do it. I find that a lot of the people that I work with can only keep one idea in their head at, the, at a time. So let's make it sort of sexist. Not, yeah. not offending me with that truth. Yeah. <laughs> I would have thought I was just stating the obvious. But, and, and we can only keep one idea. So I find that the idea of saying, oh, I'm going to do that until I do this doesn't work. So... Uh, a, a clear example that I see is with, uh, with tree changes or people moving from the city to small farms, that while they've still got their job, they're going to spend all their money regenerating this farm. And then yeah, when they quit their job, it's all going to be rosy. It never happens because you set up these patterns of behaviour. Mm -hmm. So I tend to just leave that alone. I don't mind if people do it, but you won't get that from me. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'd be saying very strongly... No, put in the practice areas. You might continue managing the way you are at the moment on the rest of the place, but put in the practice areas. Learn how not to do that, um, not to have to re-sow. Um, all that uh, that picture I had at the bottom was one of our practice areas on the Q&A slide, and that sort of just that was all Cape weed and broadleaf and things like that, and that's only just been managed with grazing. But you've got to learn to do that. So. Now, I, I've been surveying, this is at McIver Farm, 
um, yeah, two brac, uh, mm-hmm. which you've been to as well. And I was, I've been surveying that in the last week. Uh, we've been trying to get, we're, we're building a for the farm, which goes very much to what you were talking about before about how people, uh, people, re- people in, it's important that people, uh, do holistic management planned grazing, but how they do it. Um, I agree with you in that it should be ultimately self-determined and it's something that they can be comfortable with. So what we're doing uh, at MacIver uh, with their pig and cattle and sometimes sheep operation, but predominantly pig, is I'm building a very large size wall map, which is an aerial photo with all of the paddocks marked on it and all of the uh, water lines and water hydrants all marked on it. And everything has a code, everything has a number. And it'll take up a wall. Um, So it's going to be printed on vinyl onto some steel sheet. Um, Wow. And and that'll be in their main workshop. Mm -hmm. And then they'll have magnets, little fridge magnets, if you you will, little magnets which will indicate where the animals are at any given time because they might have 20 different grower groups um, and they've got 120 sows, you know. So... You've got a lot of complexity going on on this 500-acre landscape, so we need to keep our heads around that so that we can record better and track it all. One of the interesting things that came out of that process of me surveying, because I've literally walked the whole 500 acres, um, has been to look at the succession that's occurred as a result of the impact of those pigs and cattle. And one of the things that I found that was really fascinating the other day, Graham, and I went to take some photos, but it was so windy, it was unbelievable. So I, I didn't. I'm going back out there today, I hope. Um, was that kangaroo grass, Themeter um, triandra or Themeter australis, was actually coming, was actually, uh, coming back in areas that had been grazed and rooted by pigs. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't what I expected to see. And it wasn't just coming back a little bit. It was coming. So what we had was, uh, a, you know, rye grass, fog grass, phalaris. Pigs come in, do their job on that, where we're basically getting no more than about 10 to 20% ground cover loss. But, uh, you know, disturbance. Yeah, yeah. Um, nutrient being brought in by, because the pigs are being fed. And then seeing this response in this particular or well, fairly significant area is actually on this slope here, over here, which is a dry, um, half this farm is gra- granite and half this farm is metamorphosed sediments. And it's over on this drier sedimentary country that the, um, which has got very skeletal, hot, uh, uh, high infiltration soils, low carbon, that the, that the kangaroo grass came back and it was luxuriant. Yeah, fantastic. So would you have anything to say to that sort of response at all, Graham? Yeah. One... It surprised me. I, I just thought yeah. it, would, it wouldn't happen like that. No, and, and I wouldn't have thought it, uh, it you know, like that um, that would be the obvious way of doing it. Where we, <laughs> no, where... no, I mean, I, if I wanted to grow kangaroo <laughs> grass, I wouldn't normally <laughs> recommend you have pig yeah. grazing. <laughs> But uh, as you were talking, because my brain was running, because like you know, with the Australian native grasses and, and all that, they, they feed through their association with fungi and they don't tend to germinate until the conditions are right. So mm-hmm. as a wild, a wild population, they're very drought tolerant because they, mm-hmm. they sort of don't germinate when they think we should. So, um, and so I was just thinking, so you've initiated germination of those and they're obviously if they're luxuriant then they're they're feeding really well so it's going to be fungal and then yeah like i go oh yeah how does that fit with the rooting around but yeah um we know that like the victorian volcanic plain was a kangaroo grassland yeah uh dominant and that was hadn't you know uh yeah, millions of bilbies, betongs and bandicoots digging and rooting around in it. So maybe one of the reasons, you know, like that we're starting to lose it in other areas is just that sort of that, uh, you know, like, you know, those bilbies, betongs and bandicoots turn soil. They can at high density make it look like a pig paddock. So that's um, right. I mean, I've seen that yeah. with echidnas. Um, I mean, obviously, all the way I would look at it is that the mycorrhizal fungi and others, but particularly the mycorrhizals, 
which I think is what you're referring to here as fungi. Um, a lot of those would have co-evolved with these burrowing, digging organisms, and the pig is a sort of a well, a, yeah. a megafauna version and um, yeah. <laughs> a megaphonic <laughs> version, and um, and we're getting an analog of that effect. And I know having uh, Colin Sice talks about that with and Bruce Maynard talk about that with their with their cropping systems in that the the no-till drills and tillage is somewhat of an analog, although metallic. Mm. Of, of those uh, of, of that of that fauna um, and, yeah. and and the work that they do in yeah, just, microsites, yeah, yep, and sort of like with that um, those knife points that Cole uses for his pasture cropping. So he's got really good research that shows that um, it it'll germinate a lot more of those grasses with oats and and with and without oats. So with oats, it'll germinate more as well, which is. Mm really interesting so like yeah, it, it uh, that disturbance as well as providing nutrient or you know like uh, root exudates out of the oats so uh, you know there might be another analog in there somewhere with the you know the amount of nutrient that the pigs are bringing in as well yes i'd true. love to see the photos so. yeah yeah well i'll be going back out there today and, I, and definitely tomorrow but um to do some more surveying and in that area so yeah i'll see what i can get all right, well, um, I think we're just about out of time. Yeah, we've got 10 minutes to go. If anyone else has got any questions to, to come, that would be um, fantastic. There's still quite a few people there, so if you've got any yeah. questions. Otherwise, um, I'm going to just leap, leap over and uh, um, just check in on what we've got coming up um, and also with what you've got coming up, Graeme, um, with... Uh, uh, financial planning and consulting you you've got some workshops that you've got uh, coming up which is great um, we're doing the same with you in, within the agrarians workplace uh, um, next week um, which I'll, I'll get back to that point next week uh, um, on on the 6th of March uh, I think the, it's going to be on the 7th uh, is where we are but for those of you who are in um, the, the US and uh, or on the, in the Americas and Eurasia, it'll be the sixth. Uh, but next week we celebrate 25 years in business, so um, it'll be a special edition. And Joel Salatin is going to be with us, so we're pretty excited to have our dear friend Joel, um, who's now not just the uh, um, involved with Polyface Farm with his uh, family there, but also the editor um, following the, um, the the sad passing of. Uh, Mr. Nations um, at the, the Stockman Grassland Farmer. So, um, and I know that he's taken on that. He did. Joel did have a bit of time working with a newspaper. I think now he's got his, <laughs> he's got he's got the kind of newspaper he really wants to be involved with. So um, he's enjoying that role, even though it involved the death of his close friend. So it'll be great to catch up with Joel. And with that, uh, we're looking to introduce uh, Regrarian's new subscription program. Um, so it'll be more about that on that day or on that week. Um, so you'll be able to see what we've got in store there. So the ambition of ours is to shift a lot of our activity um, in terms of our financial interaction with, uh, with people to being more subscription based. So think of us like a, like a community supported agriculture will be a community supported consultancy and a content provider. So, and part of that will be, um, working with people like Graham, who's uh, a strong member of our team um, within the Regrarians Workplace and in the Rex program, which we've got the next one starting up in April. Um, so, um, so you'll be able to do your Rex uh, now as part of a subscription. So, um, so you'll get ongoing support uh, or a lot more support than what you would have otherwise um, when you were doing a standalone Rex. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. And that'll be over 12 months that you'll be able to get that support um, with some of the higher levels of subscription. Uh, we're going to be in uh, far north Queensland next month uh, on, on a number of properties. I did a radio interview with ABC yesterday about that. So ABC Radio in that part of the world. So we'll be um, at Alkin Bar Station, uh, which is a 78,000 acre property um, on the top of the divide inland from Townsville. Um, we're also going to be with the Laferve family who've got a uh, mango uh, operation, a uh, really innovative mango operation, and uh, they also run livestock and are looking at uh, building, on, building in some diversity into their operation through an open consultancy. 
Um, their kids are coming back to the farm and all of that. So all of that sort of exciting planning about how you can do all of that. And then we've also got another workshop uh, just at Charters Towers uh, where we're doing a uh, program there um, for smaller landholders, bearing in mind that a smaller landholder in that area is about a thousand acres. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're calling it a small holders property. I think, uh, I think it, the people with a backyard have got 500 acres or something, but anyway, it's um, horses for courses. So that'll be up there. Um, and also in April, uh, we're in far North Queensland with Joel Salatin um, and the uh, Fitzroy Basin Association uh, who are running a week with Joel and uh, we'll be up there with him. And uh, um, if you enrol in that, you get a free uh, Polyfaces DVD in your, in your, um, in your show bag that they, that they, uh, that they give you. So that's, that's a good reason to travel all the way to far North Queensland just so you can get a show bag with Polyfaces in it. And uh, also, uh, we've got the RON program starting. So, Regrarians Online is something that we've been playing with for a few years now, beta testing and all of the rest of it. So, this is where we do very targeted um, programs. Um, so, we'll be doing two of those a week starting on May 1. Um, the, the, what we'll be doing from May 1 is uh, doing a topic out of the Regrarians Handbook uh, per week. Um, that week too, uh, we'll also be launching with um, uh, some producers, uh, Michelle McManus and Jeff Power from Southampton Farm will be taking us through a program of producer to producer type talks in the wrong program where people can um, sit down and, uh, and reflect with them on how to, how to start up uh, a pastured poultry operation and a poultry operation which has a processing Center and uh, uh, value add center on, excuse me, on farm. So um, yeah, we're fairly excited about that, and that'll that'll do what a lot of people are after, which uh, it goes to what uh, Graham was saying that um, people want, um, and we're getting this feedback all the time. People want really targeted stuff that's that really dives into the detail about a whole range of different issues um, when it comes to agricultural transformation. So, Graham, did you have anything that you've got coming up that you wanted to share, mate? Yeah, um, I was just thinking that on the Stiper website, um, yep. the Stiper newsletter has articles uh, on the things that I've been talking about. So, okay, we'll just get uh, that up. A, a lot of risk and stuff that those things that I talk about. Um, and you can yep. go back through there. So, the latest newsletter is sort of on that front page. Yep. Um, uh, just sort of over there, a bit on the right. You can oh, see yep, latest it. newsletter, yep. Okay, yeah. got that. And then there's publications. You can click on publications and go into... Right. So how do you become a member of uh, Stiper, Graham? Um, oh, there, there's... Uh, yeah. You can either drop me an email or just fill out the form I'll and... Fill out the form there, yep. Okay. Yep, and, uh, and that helps us keep going. We're, we're looking at doing... Um, Oh, Fraser Pogue, uh, Colin Sice and myself are looking at running a webinar. So for the oh, cool. Stiper membership on sort of getting set up for their um, uh, their multi-species cover cropping, if people are interested in that. So we do things sort of for the membership as well as the newsletter. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, like, in, yeah, sort of not very high cost. Um, yeah, so we're doing that. And then we've got sort of uh, coaching and training ongoing. Um, We've got sort of, I was just looking at, it, we've got some visitors coming, which is always a lot of fun. I enjoy that. And we're looking at sort of doing more of that sort of training people here. Yeah. Uh, we're finding just that it, you know, because it's set up and the animals are trained, people can just focus on actually how does it work. So. And have you got any conferences coming up with Stiper as well? Uh, not until uh, November. So, yeah. Of this so, year, 2018? Yeah. So we're yeah. looking at sort of... Um, we were looking at uh, getting Gabe out uh, yep. again, that which went really well, but yep. Uh, yep. we're still in the, the sort of the planning stages of that. So. Okay, well that'll be good. I think that that was a getting Gabe out was a really from last time that was a really big uh, stimulus, wasn't it, to a whole range of different activities occurring because yeah. of the success and that he's having and um, the name that he's building. Um, and the value yeah. of the information and how complimentary it is to see someone from uh, that part of the world come out and work with people like Colin and, uh, 
and others. Yeah. And we've and we've got quite a few workshops sort of booked in, so you might see them popping up. But if you wanted one in your area, just drop us a line and uh, we can work out how we can organise that. Fantastic. Well, it's a great organisation. How long has Steepy been going for now? Since 97. So yeah. just, yeah, it started not-for-profit farmer association that uh, just promotes uh, native grasses, but it's sort of evolved into that whole grassland soil health, mm. you know. Uh, low input sort of type area. Yeah, no, it's something that uh, a lot of people have got a lot of value from and more than anything else or more than any other organisation has sort of shown people the value in our own native grasses which were admonished for so long yeah. so, <laughs> for all of their incredible value. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's, 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 that's colonialism. Yeah. One of one that's in the colonialism that's... handbook. Always discard what you find yourself coming to. Yeah. Well, that's sort of um, my throwaway line when I'm presenting. I do that sort of, they know a surprising amount about living in Australia, these Australian native grasses. Yeah, just a little bit, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They can even cope with the low carbon uh, environments that uh, that we've seemed to manage as white fellas since we come. So yeah. how about that? <laughs> yeah. They're survivors, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for for um, sharing your time with us today, Graham. It's uh, always a pleasure and an, uh, incredibly insightful. And um, I've got some links there if people are interested. Uh, and we've got your website, handfortheland.com, which, uh, of course, you can um, talk to Graham about to take up his offer. So all of those half hours that you once had, Graham, are about to be all taken up. Um, <laughs> careful what you wish for there, mate. Um, but Graham does a great job. I've worked with Graham on a number of jobs and um, his, uh, his care and attention um, and capabilities as a consultant are, uh, um, are first rate. And um, so I really appreciate working with him on that level. Um, uh, stiper.com.au also uh, Graham uh, works with uh, both the Savory Institute and Holistic Management International so there's their links and our own so um, thank you Graham and uh, we look Thanks, forward Darren. to, uh, to uh, hearing from you soon and, um, and keeping on with all of this program that we're involved with Great, and we'll catch Thanks. up with the rest of you next week and uh, if you've got any questions that are supplementary just type them in here in the, on the Facebook page and, um, and get the conversation going on there. And so with that, um, thank, every, thank you, everyone, and uh, we'll catch you next week. See you there. Bye. Thanks, mate.